All right, first of all, a quick pop quiz. Do you know the answers to these questions? Uh, you don't have to answer them now, but it's merely a opportunity to just be honest with yourself about your knowledge. Now, if you're already investing in property, you probably uh, know a lot of this, but there's probably a lot of things you don't know too. We, we know a lot about property investment success in Australia and the different results. We know, for example, that if you go back 20 years, only 6% of the population were investing in property. We know now that if you uh, have a look, you'll find that 18% of taxpayers are investing in property. But of that 18% of taxpayers who invest in property, only 93% um, 93 of them do not get passed through property. So only 7% are actually what I would deem as successful, able to grow a portfolio larger than that. So it's very important that you know the basics and that you uh, know how to grow a portfolio from there. Okay, so the pop quiz. Do you know what LBR stands for? Do you know what equity is? What is the rental yield on a property and how is it calculated? How much of your money does it cost to acquire a property and how much of the banks? How much of your money will it cost you to hold a property? And what key factors make property prices go up? Okay, so first of all, why should we invest in property? Well, first of all, it's arguably low and manageable risk. Of all the forms of investment, property, uh, especially residential property, if you're investing in uh, the middle of the market, is one of the most stable forms of investing you can possibly get into. Uh, we, if you don't believe that, well, you just have to look at the results of the Australian property market over the years. Even in the GFC, uh, whilst the high end of our market did take a hit, the middle of the market held very firm, only taking a modest correction of maybe 5 or 10%, and then bouncing back pretty much as soon as uh, the GFC had blown over. So if you're looking for a way to invest that's low risk, um, whilst no form of investment is completely risk-free, you don't get any lower risk than residential property, in my view. It's an appreciating asset. Now, property won't go up in value all of the time, there will be times when it goes flat, even times when it comes back slightly. But long term, it is a solid growth asset that's been proven year after year after year to grow. Tax benefits. Uh, we're going to talk about that tonight. Some of you are going to be pretty blown away by the tax benefits that you get from investment properties. We, most people know that they should go get an investment property to save on tax, but very few actually understand how that works. So we're going to go through that tonight. Uh, high leverage potential. You can borrow up to 95%. Now, this is a key point of difference that the people who uh, you know, say that you should buy shares routinely forget to mention. Um, with property, you can buy a much greater asset than the amount of money you've got to invest. For example, with, say, $60,000 of your own money, you could then borrow enough to buy a half a million dollar investment property that, if you know what you're doing, you can find will pay for itself, and then, you know, what's going to make you more money? 60 grand invested in cash uh, or into directly into shares or a half a million dollars sitting on the market? Okay, and then you can safely expect that a property will appreciate faster than inflation over time because of the supply and demand equation in its most simple form. We live on an island and our, as our population grows, uh, the amount of land will stay the same but the, the demand for that land to live on will increase. So what you get there is a uh, consistently uh, demand is higher than supply situation. Okay, so what's one example? Well, this is an example of what I've done personally in the past, and it's quite uh, possible for anyone if you know what you're doing. Okay, a little while ago, uh, I was still full-time employed. I was actually in the Army at that time. I did 14 years in the Army and um, I was investing on the side. Now, when I started investing, I made all the rookie mistakes that I'm going to try and help you to avoid uh, today. But this is when this happened is when I started to see some real success. So I bought two properties. The first property was $470,000, and I put a 10% deposit down. It cost me 23 grand in costs. So it cost me about 70 grand of my own money to buy that property. And then the second property was a $620,000 property and it cost me about 61 of my own money to buy. In turn, it cost me 131 grand of my own money. Now, 
When I bought these properties, I bought them in an area that I knew was booming. I knew it was going to boom. I'd done my research. I knew there were jobs being created. There was a shortage of land and house prices had to go up. And I think that's the first thing that most investors miss. You must understand that owning an investment property is completely different to owning your own home. The criteria for buying your own home is completely different from the criteria for buying an investment property. But most would-be property investors make that mistake and they say silly things like, well, if I wouldn't live in it, it wouldn't be a good investment property. You must understand that's absolute rubbish. Okay, the factors that push prices up have nothing to do with the factors about where you need to live. You need to live near your family, you need to live near your work, you need to live near your hobbies. But when it comes to property investing, it's not those things that are gonna push the prices up. So I bought these properties. Now, within one year, this is what happened. The first property had gone up 130 grand and the second property had gone up the same amount. Now, that's what a little bit of research can do. Money in, money out, 338K. That's a 258% return on my own money in 12 months. Now, you show me something else that can do that and, uh, and I'll be a convert. But property has this amazing result because of the ability to borrow money to get into a higher, um, size, a bigger size asset and then hold that asset in the market. All right, so the first thing you need to do is evaluate your mindset. Now, what I say to everybody is that chances are you were taught wrong about money. Nine out of 10 of us are born into families of low to middle income and we're in, uh, who are trapped in what you call the rat race. You know, and the rat race is the working for money rat race. Now, when you think about it, when you left school, you were probably told to get a job and because you were taught that the way to get money is to work for it. But actually, that's false. The easiest way to get money is to invest, but you need to have a little bit of money up front and that's what, why most of us can't, do it, can't avoid going to work. You also need to have a job if you want the banks to lend you money. But the real money, the real wealth creation will be made from buying assets that then make money for you, not working yourself into the ground for your whole life. So it all starts with your mindset. And when I started investing in property and started my educational journey to learn about it, a lot of people said to me, Damien, you must understand it's 90% in your head um, and 10% action. Now at that time, I remember thinking, what a load of rubbish, just hurry up and get to the bit where you showed me how to make my money. But now that I've coached thousands of people in property investment, I know that to be an absolute truth. It is 90% in your head. I see a lot of people sabotage themselves all the time. So it, start, it starts with being honest with yourself about the way you think about things and also being honest with yourself about your current financial situation. Uh, amongst your peer group, are you the person who's been the most successful financially or are you struggling? Are there people you went to school with who perhaps you didn't think were as smart as you but yet they've got more money than you now? Why is that so? I can tell you what it's not, it's not luck. And a lot of people will get lazy and say, oh, they just got lucky. That's not true. Okay, often it's just a difference in knowledge and then taking action on that knowledge. So there's these things called limiting beliefs and obstacles. And we have to be really honest with ourselves about our attitudes to those things. The strategies your parents um, suggest to you probably won't succeed today. You, I think what, one thing that a lot of people fail to realise is that our... The way that um, you know, funding our own retirement works in this country has dramatically changed. Our, most of our parents grew up in, a, in, a, um, in an Australia where all you had to do was pay taxes all your life and then when you retired, you'd be given the old age pension. That's no longer the case. Um, in the late 80s and early 90s, they brought in superannuation and said everyone must seek to fund their own retirement. At that time, they stopped putting up the old age pension. So. Whilst it might have been fine to just buy a house and pay it off and then retire on the pension, you can't do that anymore. You must do more than that. You must tend to your own retirement, otherwise you're going to retire broke. You should also be very careful about who you listen to. Only listen to people if you want to achieve the same success they've achieved. Okay, so a lot of us really trust our parents and get our financial education from our parents. And that's fine. If your parents are filthy rich, then keep listening to what they say. But if they're not, then you need to be a bit honest about that. Obviously, don't offend them, but you need to seek your education elsewhere. And watch out for those Monday's experts. Uh, when I started 
uh, Integrity, my company, my very first client, I put him into a property and 12 months later, it was worth 150 grand more than he bought it for. And we were able to then go and get another two properties off the back of that and a fourth property would be super. So in the space of two years, he went from having zero property to having four. But um, he said to me though, after the first 12 months, he said he almost didn't buy that property. And the reason he said was that he went to work the next day and his mate said um, to him that, you know, he told his mate that he was buying a property. His mate said, where is it? And he told him the location. And his mate said to him, I've never heard of it. If I've never heard of it, it can't be a good place to invest. And, and it really rattled him because this was a, a guy who'd been his friend for a very long time. And uh, this, this friend, uh, he had trusted in all sorts of things. This, this friend knew deep, dark secrets about him. And uh, when he said it, it really rattled him. And, and, of course, he did go on and buy that property. And I asked him, I said, well, what did you do? And he said, well, you know, uh, I thought about it, but then I realised that my mate, whilst I really respected him and liked him and, and trusted him, he didn't know anything about property investment, so I went with your suggestion instead. And that's that's what we ended up doing. So you've got to be very, very careful about that sort of thing and um, be careful who you talk to about property investment. I'm not saying to ignore your parents or ignore anyone else. I think the main thing is just to critically analyse what they're saying and uh, and have a look at whether they've got runs on the board or not themselves. Okay, so why do we invest in property? now? There's a whole heap of sayings that poor people say to other poor people so they don't feel bad about being poor. And you've got to be very careful of those. One of those is that money is the root of all evil. A lot of people will use that as a cop-out to say, oh, look, you know, I don't want money because I don't want to be evil. Let me, let me tell you something about money. Money doesn't make you evil. What money does is it amplifies who you are. So if you're already a jerk, money's going to make you a bigger jerk. If, but if you're a good person, Having access to money is going to make you a great person because you'll do wonderful things with that wealth. Now, tell me though, if money's the root of all evil, uh, tell me if these things are evil. Is educating your children evil or, or even your children's children, maybe leaving some sort of legacy behind, an educational trust fund for all your descendants? Is getting the best healthcare evil? Um, anyone who's been very sick will know that healthcare in Australia is not free. Um, and if you've ever had lost anyone in the family who's died of a slow death, you'd know what palliative care is. In Australia, most palliative care is where you go to die if you've got some sort of degenerative uh, sickness that's going to take you out slowly. Now, in Australia, it's order a room in most states for that until your last, very last moments when they're sure you're about to pass, and then maybe, if you're lucky, you'll get your own room. Um, so, you know, you need to be able to fund that. Is travelling evil? Is supporting charities evil? Is having a few recreational toys evil? And is spending more time with your loved ones evil? Well, if you want to spend more time with your loved ones, you're going to have to spend either less time sleeping or less time at work. Now, most people aren't happy to negotiate with sleep, losing sleep, but they're quite happy to give up some time working. But the problem with that is most of us get stuck in this rat race of having to work for money and uh, we need money uh, so therefore we work. But if you want to escape that and you want to spend more time with your loved ones and spend more time pursuing your hobbies and doing all these things, well, there's one thing you need to do all those things, one thing that all these things have in common, and that is money. Uh, you need money to do all these things. And there's no point in lying to yourself about it. You need more money than you need. And what, does that, what does that mean? Well, you need money to pay for your food, water, accommodation, electricity, car and petrol to get to and from work. You need money to pay for all your hobbies, those things that make you happy. Maybe it's guitar lessons, maybe it's fishing, maybe it's what travel, whatever. Um, you need money to fund your retirement. Um, and, you know, depending on how long you plan on living for, that could be a very long time. And but finally, you know, you need money for those things that you don't plan on, like that illness that you thought you were never going to get, like that drunk driver who crashed into your car despite the fact that you're the very best driver you know, um, for when you lose your job. All of those things, you need money for the unexpected. So you need more money than you think you need. And uh, you can stick your head in the sand and deny it, but as long as you do that, you're not going to take the action you need to get yourself in a position where you're comfortable. Okay, I think the first thing that most people fail to understand 
is that there is a difference between good and bad debt. Now, most families will teach you that all debt is bad, and uh, that's not true, okay? Some debt is bad, but some debt is good. Some debt is actually critical to accumulating wealth if, if you're going to get ahead from a, um, from a middle-income, low-income type perspective. So the definition of good and bad debt is this. Good debt is debt that's used to buy assets that make you money. Assets that either go up in value, bring in an income, or do both. Bad debt is debt that's used to buy assets to go down in value, like cars, jet skis, holidays, all those sorts of things. So it's perfectly okay to have good debt, but it's not okay to have bad debt. So if you've got car loans, holiday loans, all those sorts of things, then you need to eliminate them as soon as possible. But if you've got debt against properties and things like that, then that is not a bad thing because those properties generally will service that debt for you and they'll allow that debt will allow you to hold a greater asset in the market. And you'll see later on what that happens, how, how that happens. Okay. All right, what's a loan to value ratio? When you're borrowing money, you need to understand how these things work. The banks have all sorts of rules and they anchor them against certain loan to value ratios. So what is an LVR? Well, let's say we've got this property here with a $450,000 loan and its value is 500 grand. Well, a loan to value ratio is, is what percentage of the property's value is the loan. So in this case, 450 is to 500, which equals 90%. And that's how they work out an LVR. Now, some banks will, will uh, put limits on how much they can lend you versus the value of the property. And the reason why they do that is because they like to keep what they call some security in the property, i.e. if you don't pay the loan, they can foreclose, sell the property for 500 grand in this case, and get enough money to pay out the loan, but also the administrative costs, the agents, commissions, and the lot. Rental yield. What is rental yield? Well, rental yield is the percentage of a property's value that we get back in rent every year. So by way of example, if this property is worth $500,000 and it rents for 500 bucks a week, well then it rents for 28,600 a year. Sorry, 550 a week is 28,600 a year. So what percentage of 500 grand is 28,600? And it's very simple, we just divide the rent by the value and then times it by 100 to convert it to a percentage. So in this case, that particular property would be getting a yield of 5 to 7, 5.72%. Uh, now, why would we want to know that? Well, if we're going to borrow pretty much all of the money to buy a property, then we know at the moment, for example, the interest rate's at 5%. So if the yield is greater than the interest rate, then we've got, we can have some confidence that the property is going to pay its own bills. If you had a yield that was 4%, for example, you would know that you would have to chip in some money to do that. Equity, what is equity? Okay, so equity is the difference in a property's value to its loan. Difference in a property's value to its loan. So in this case, we've got a $500,000 property with a loan of 275. The total equity in this case then is the value minus the loan, which is 225,000. But also we have what we call available equity. Now, as I mentioned earlier, banks will only lend up to a certain percentage of the value of a property. So whilst the total equity on that property might be 225 grand, the available equity is much less. So what we need to do is work out what the LBR limit is, in this case, 90%, subtract the, uh, the loan amount from that, and that leaves us with 175K. So in this case, this property, we could borrow another $175,000 against this property if we wanted to, and we could use that for a number of things. We could use that to cover the deposits on a few more investment properties. We could use that to buy the new you know, sports car we wanted. We could use that to pay around the world holiday. Of course, we need to be very careful about doing that and making sure that the rent that that property is receiving uh, will cover the expense, the extra expense of having the loan, the extra payments, and as the years go by, the rents will go up and you'll be able to do that. And that's how the wealthy pull money out of properties without having to sell them. In fact, not that long ago, one of our live training days, we had somebody come along and he said to me, he said, geez, I wish I met you six months ago. And I said, why is that? And he said, well, I just went on a round the world holiday and uh, for six months. And before I left, I sold my investment property 
to raise the money to pay for the holiday. And he, and he said to me, he said, I didn't know that I could just refinance it to pull the money out. So it's very important to understand how that works so you never sell. Because when you sell an investment property, you kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. And, um, you know, you might, get a, you might get a big feed on that day, but you'll never get uh, any more eggs out of that property. It'll never make you any more money. Also, too, when you sell, you get taxed. And um, so a knowledge of how finance works is very, very important to make sure that you can, um, you know, work your portfolio to the greatest advantage. All right, acquisition costs. So when we have an investment property, we talk about two costs. We talk about the acquisition cost and the holding cost. The acquisition cost is how much of your money is it going to cost you to buy the property. So we're not talking about the overall price. We're talking about how much of your money do you have to throw in to acquire the property. And then the holding cost is how much of your money do you have to put in, if any, week to week to then hold that property thereafter. So here's an example. Here on the left, we've got um, you know, a classic looking investment property, modern investment property, price point 422,500, renting for 425 a week. So what's the acquisition cost? Well, straight away, we're gonna need a 10% deposit. Then we're gonna to need to pay stamp duty. So there's a, a sample amount of what stamp duty would be on there. Um, loan fees, every loan, there'll usually be an establishment fee. So we put that in there, about 550. Building inspector's fee, now, when you're an investor, you should be doing two inspections buying a property. The first inspection uh, should be a full thorough inspection by your building inspector where they'll create a report. And then the second, in and then you'll, if there's anything wrong with the property, you then provide that to the vendor and say to them, hey, I want you to fix that before I buy it. And then you send the same building inspector back for a second inspection. That'll cost you about 550, maybe 650 these days. All right, quantity surveyor. We're going to talk about depreciation later. 75% of property investors do not claim depreciation according to the ATO, and that's absolute madness, and you'll see why later. But to get a depreciation, we're going to talk about depreciation in a second, but to get the schedule done, it's 590 in most cases. Solicitor, a solicitor, you should always budget up to two grand, and always be wary of the, um, you know, the chop shop type uh, conveyancing firms that do mass production and try and do it cheaply. It's really not the sort of thing you want to necessarily cut costs on. You want to make sure you've got a proper solicitor who can protect you um, from anything that could go wrong. And then a letting fee. Now, a letting fee, when, you're, when you hire a rental manager to manage your property for you, the rental manager will charge you the first week's rent in order to find you a tenant. So we always consider that as part of our acquisition cost. So the total investment to buy this investment probably would be $59,577. So that's how much money of your money you'd have to stump up. Now, if you're buying your first property, you'd need to save that amount of money or borrow that money from family. If you're buying subsequent properties, however, you might just do an equity loan from the, from the first investment property for $60,000 and then use the money from that equity loan to cover the cost of the next property. We'll talk more about that later. Okay, so how would you be approved for a loan? Now, if you're a first time buyer, the banks, and there are some banks that will lend you up to 95% for an investment property. Now, they could lend that to you if you have no defaults on your credit file. If you do have defaults on your credit file, then get in touch with us because there are a few agencies now that are helping people to clean up their credit file. And depending on how bad it is, will, will depend on how much it costs you. But can I say it's worth doing? If you're in a position to invest, but you don't, but no one will lend you the money because of a black mark in your credit file, then make sure that you do get in touch with us because there are a few, as I said, a few people can help you do that now and it'll be money very well spent and we can refer you on to those people. Um, if you have no or low credit card debt and personal loans, if you've been in your current job for a while and are not on probation, and if you have genuine savings, they'll probably lend you some money. All right, so the next thing we're gonna go on to after this slide is the holding costs on a property. But before we do that, we need to understand how properties save you on tax. Now, um, a lot of people don't understand this and it's, and it's quite important that you learn it now. On the left-hand side of the slide, you can see there's the current tax brackets. Now. The, a lot of people don't understand how the tax system works in Australia. 
The key thing to understand about it, firstly, is it's a marginal tax system. And what that means is that the richest person in Australia and the poorest person in Australia don't pay any tax on the first $18,200. And then every dollar they earn after that, up until 37 grand, they pay 19% of that. And then from 37 to 80, they pay 32 and so on. And you can see at the moment there's a 2% debt levy. You also have a 2% Medicare, but we just leave that out to keep it simple at the moment. All right, so let's say that we're on 100 grand a year and we own this investment property in the top right. Now that property is worth 500,000 and it rents for 500 a week. Now the first thing you must understand about having an investment property is that the rent you receive from a property is actually taxable income. So if you don't have any deductions at this point in time, you're gonna have a tax bill, not a tax return. So that takes our gross taxable income up to 126. Now we need the deductions to wipe that out. So the first deduction we're gonna claim will be the loan interest. And in, in, in all property investing, loan interest is always the number one expense that's associated with holding the property. And then soon after that, uh, body corporate and things like that. So in this case, we've got, it's a house with no body corporate fees. And can I say, we'll talk a bit about that later, but stay away from units and um, townhouses as investment because generally their cash flow is pretty poor. And um, you, know, you can only own so many properties that you have to top up. If you have to throw in 200 bucks a week of your own money, then you'll get, most people will run out at one or two properties. Now, those properties might be in blue chip locations with strong chances of capital growth, but you'll only ever own two of them. Who's going to make more money? The person who's got 10 properties that are all paying for themselves, um, but maybe not as blue chip locations, or the person who's only got two blue chip locations. 10 properties paying for themselves in average areas is going to make you far more money than only two properties in blue chip areas. But I digress, back on task. So we're up 26 grand with our rent, but then our cash deductions have reduced our income by $27,950 in this case. Now, what's really interesting about this at the moment is that we haven't talked about depreciation yet. And 75% of property investors are not claiming depreciation. And uh, we know this because every year the ATO does a summary of tax returns. And in that summary, they report the statistics about the different tax returns. And they tell us that 75% every year don't claim it. Now, it's quite alarming. A lot of people, uh, I think, just don't claim it because they have no idea what depreciation is. But if we didn't claim depreciation, where would we be at this point in time? Well, we're 26 grand up for rent and we're, say, 28 grand down. So really, we've only got two grand to claim on tax, which at 37% is not going to be a lot of money. It's going to be, what, uh, about $74,000 which is, uh, sorry, $7,400. It'd be nice if it was $74,000. So um, $740, that's it. That's all we're going to get back. Now, let's add the depreciation. Now, a brand new four bedroom home at the moment, you'll be able to depreciate that in its first year at about 15 grand if you use the diminishing value method. Now, admittedly, that does taper off um, over the years, but if you're building a portfolio, you should always be adding new properties to your portfolio to get that extra depreciation. And um, you, the, the assumption is that the rents will be rising at the same time as the depreciation is tapering off, so it should compensate for that. But if you're getting that 15 grand in your first year depreciation, it's an on paper deduction. Unlike cash deductions, where money actually has to leave your bank account for you to then claim 37 or 32 and a half percent back, with depreciation, it's just an on paper deduction. Now, what is depreciation? Well, in theory, the building you're sitting in right now. The land is not going down in value, but the building itself is. The blinds are going down in value, the carpet's going down in value, all those things uh, that relate to the structure are going down in value. And the ATO allows us to write off the, the building and all of its um, you know, fixtures over time. So that's what depreciation is, and that's why we get to claim. But is that piece of real estate really going down in value in such a way? Well, no, it's not, of course but yet we can make an on-paper deduction. Now, let's see what effect that has. What it has is it's, no money leaves our bank account, but on paper, we look like we've made a massive loss. We look like we've lost 17 grand now instead of, instead of two grand. So our taxable income is now assessed to be $83,000, not the 100,000 that our employer was paying tax against. So now we're entitled to a refund. If we take away the difference of $16,950 or 17 grand, 
then we should get a tax return of about $6,270, which is five and a half grand more than we were going to get without that depreciation. Now, this is really, really important point for investors to realise. Five and a half grand a year in your tax is the equivalent to over $100 a week. Now, if you look at that investment property there, it's renting for 500 a week. There's $100 a week extra money or 20% increase that you're missing if you don't know what depreciation is and you're not buying the right stuff. You could have two houses that are side by side, one that's brand new and dripping wet with depreciation funds and one that's old, and they might be the same price, but the brand new one is going to save you, is going to cost you less to hold. And that's really, really important if you want to make sure all your properties are paying for themselves. All right, so then how do we calculate the rest of the holding costs? Well, let's look at this property again on the left. Interest on the loan at 92% loan, let's say a 90% loan plus the mortgage insurance added on, which is usually about 2%. Rental management fees, rates, insurance, maintenance. There are our total cash expenses of $25,866. But then we've got our depreciation and our total deductions is about 40 grand. So then we have the rent received and our tax return. So where does that prop, let me go back. Where does that property leave us? So in real terms, we've only had cash expenses of $25,866. But in terms of money actually received, we've received 22 grand in the rent and we've received seven grand in our tax return. So we're getting 26 grand going out the door and 29 grand coming in. So you can see what a massive difference that depreciation is. And that property there is actually what we call a negative cash flow, i.e. before tax, we get less rent than we've got cash expenses. But then after tax, we end up in front. So we're negative cash flow before tax and then positively geared after tax. Okay, so what makes a good property? Well, first and foremost, you must understand that it's the location that makes your money not the house itself. And, it, and there's no such thing as the Australian property market. Every market is different. And a property market, from an investing perspective, is defined as one commutable distance from the employment centre. So, for example, uh, Sydney is a property market, but Newcastle and Wollongong are very different markets. Same in Brisbane, Sunshine Coast, Gold Coast. Same in Perth and, uh, you know, go down south, down to the wine region totally different property markets, all based around the job, wherever the jobs are, the, the job employment centre. Because people with jobs buy houses, so if jobs are being created in that area, then you can see that the property market will boom. If jobs are being lost, you'll see the property market will go backwards. And we can see that now happening in certain parts of um, South Australia and Victoria, where all those car factories are closing down. Those property markets in the vicinity of those car factories are in real strife. So I think mistake number one that, that new property investors make is they try and buy their property locally. And you should only buy your investment property locally if you happen to live in the number one place to invest in Australia right now. If you don't, don't buy your property there because you're going to lose out on the opportunity to make a lot of money. And got to remember why you're investing in property. You are investing in property to make money. Say it loud and proud and don't be ashamed. Unfortunately in Australia, we get taught not to talk about money, but if you want to get be good at making money, you need to talk about it. And, you need, and your goal is not to just um, have lots of money and, and get off on that. The goal is to have lots of money and then do good things with it, not hoard it and just you know look at your own bank statement. All right, so what factors are going to make a good area to invest before we um, then go and find a property in that location? Well, we want to look at supply and demand. Supply and demand is the basic economic principles of all price setting. So I'll give you an example. When Cyclone Larry wiped out all the bananas in Queensland, what happened to banana prices? Well, banana prices went up. Why did they go up? Did they go up because more people wanted to eat bananas? No, the demand was the same, but the supply was hard, and that in turn pushed the prices up. So you can have a boom from one of two things, either an increase in demand or a reduction in supply. In property investment terms, a reduction in supply might be some sort of constraint to land and ability to build houses. Um, for example, the Christchurch earthquake, most people would think that property prices in Christchurch would have been affected badly by 
um, the earthquake, but actually it was quite the reverse. Of course, those houses that were destroyed and, or, and on the fault line were then being worthless, but the rest of the houses that survived then started to shoot up in value because half the population was homeless and they needed to live in the other half of the housing. So a lot of people uh, you know, would assume that the market went backwards when in fact it went up. Um, but on the other side of things, so on the demand side, you can predict, if you do your research, you can predict what areas are going to boom based on increase in demand. How? Well, go to the areas where there's job creation, where there's strong immigration or interstate migration, and where there's infrastructure being built to make an area more attractive so people, more people will want to live there. Okay, so job creation, migrate, international migration and interstate migration, and infrastructure development that makes an area more attractive, be it extra public transport, shopping centres, all those sorts of things. Once you've identified the area that you want to invest in, then you've got to go looking for a particular property in that location. And let me, let me save you a whole lot of grief. Buy a brand new residential middle of the market property. Why? Well, first of all, buying brand new, not only do you get all that depreciation, which I, I think if there was no other reason to buy new than depreciation, you would still buy new, but you also get a whole heap of other benefits when you buy a new property. You get a, a warranty on the property. So for the first six or 12 months, depending on how long the warranty is, anything wrong with that property, the builder's got to fix it for you. You also, in most states, get a structural guarantee. And that structural guarantee is very, very important. When you think about it, if you're buying a second-hand property, you never really know for sure. Yes, you get a building inspection done, but if you've ever read a building inspector's report on a second-hand property, the legal disclaimer is about four pages long because they don't have an X-ray machine and they can't see behind the walls and they can't see the slab and they can't see the plumbing that's covered in concrete and all those sorts of things. Now, Whilst it's unlikely that you're going to uh, buy a, a property that's not structurally sound, they are out there, and if you bought one, it'd be an absolute disaster. Especially if you if you borrowed 400 grand to buy it, and then you found out later that the house had to be condemned, and it was only worth the 200 grand land value. Well, then you're in real strife. So I don't know why people would do anything other than buy a brand new property. But let, take it from me, from a risk management perspective, very very important way to do it. Also, if you're never going to sell, well, then you want to have that property forever. So if you want to have that property forever, you need it to have some longevity. If you buy it brand new, the building code in Australia is 25 years. So the property is going to last at least 25 years before you start having any issues of concern. And also, too, one of the key things about holding a property is the maintenance cost. A lot of people will go and buy the old properties in the cheaper areas to try and chase the rental yield, but still have the cash flow of that property wiped out by high maintenance costs, tenant problems, and all those sorts of things. Okay, why residential? Well, why and not commercial? Well, commercial property is actually really great when you've got a tenant. The tenant pays usually pays a very high yield and they also pay all your rates and things for you. But there's a few disadvantages to commercial property which make it um, not very good, especially for the beginners. The first disadvantage is that the most you can borrow at the moment is about 60%. And so that means you've got to stump up 40% of your own money if you want to buy a commercial property. Now, why would you do that when you can go and buy four residential properties of the same value in four different areas and increase it with 10% deposits and increase your chances of, of having some success and reducing all your risk at the same time? The second point about commercial property is that while that may be great when you've got a tenant, it's a long time between tenants because how many people today were out there looking for four-bedroom homes versus how many people today were out there looking you know, to buy a butcher shop or out there looking to buy some sort of office space or rent some sort of office space. So commercial property um, is not really the most attractive just for those sound logical reasons. And then why the middle of the market? Well, high end of the market in residential can be quite volatile. That's where you get a lot of what I call trophy properties. And, you know, why would you buy them anyway? You know, when times are good, the, the prices boom, but when times are bad, they drop quite dramatically. And I, I've previously had a client who, who owned a $2.5 million canal front home, and then when the GFC hit, their property dropped to $1 million. So they lost in six months $1.5 million of value. But at that same time, the middle of the market, it only, when the GFC hit, only dropped about 5%. And because and, that's where all the nurses, doctors, you know, uh, firemen, police officers, 
school teachers, that's where all those and government employees, that's where they all live, all the middle income earners on solid jobs. So when those sorts of, they tend to weather those storms and the market stays a lot more solid. Also then, why, and why stay away from the lower end of the market? Well, the lower end of the market, often you've got a lot of older homes that have great levels of maintenance. You also find your bad tenants there. Now I'm not saying, and I say this very, very carefully, people who live in, poor people aren't bad people, of course they're not. Money doesn't decide whether you're, whether you're good or bad. But bad people are almost always poor people because they have a really bad attitude and they treat others poorly. And as a result, that affects their employment and how much money they get paid and therefore they live in the lower end of the market. So stay away from the lower end of the market. You'll stay away from you know, pest infestation, structural problems, high maintenance costs, bad tenants, all those sorts of things. Uh, I remember I, had a, I met a guy a few years ago now, I think he was 27 at the time, and he, and he said to me, oh, yeah, mate, I've got 10 properties. And you always know, you can always spot someone uh, when they tell you how many properties they've got stri- within the two, first two seconds. And also they articulate their properties in terms of the number of properties, not the value of those properties. But he started talking to me and, and, he, and he said, oh, yeah, I've got a shed here, I've got a shack there. And not one of his properties was worth more than 150 grand. His total portfolio of 10 properties was 1.25 million. Now, you tell me what's better, 10, prop, 10 small properties like that with all the problems that go with them or three solid properties that are uh, in the middle of the market and low risk. Anyway, I said to this guy, I said, so I bet you then you've got some tenant problems. He looked at me like I was a clairvoyant and said, how did you know? And he actually, was quite funny, he actually asked me, he said, have you been speaking to my family? I said, no, mate, if you've got 10 properties all at that price point, I guarantee you you've got a bad tenant. And evidently he had two. All right. Okay, so how do we accumulate a portfolio? Well, the first thing we need to do is get the money together to buy our first property. Now, I think if you're going to buy middle of the market, you're looking at minimum 400 now for a brand new property. So that's your price point. So you're going to need 40 grand deposit um, and then about 10 grand on top. Best case, you might be able to get a 95% loan and then only put 5% in, but you will get slugged a bit more mortgage insurance. So you need to have about 50 grand at the minimum, I think comfortably $60,000. How do you get that money? Well, um, if you've got some family that are willing to support you, don't go to them and ask them for a handout. I mean, if you can get one, that's nice. But maybe you could go to your parents and say, um, hey, mum, dad, we want to buy our first property. Uh, Can you please support us? One idea that's been suggested to us is that we get an equity loan using your property as security or you as the guarantor for that small loan, and then that loan, we use the money from that loan to pay the deposit and cost. But if nobody loves you, and um, they're not going to lend you, the, or if they do love you, they don't, and they're not, they're not in a position to do it, then really there's, you've probably got no choice. You just have to uh, stump up the money. And the thing is this, if I'm quite serious about this. Knowing what property can do and how easy it can make you money if, if, it were, if I had, my, had to do it all again, that's exactly what I would do. I would rent a room, live with my parents, live in a caravan park, keep my costs down as much as possible. I'd have a full-time day job, part-time night job. I'd stop blowing money on things to impress people I don't even like. I wouldn't buy any new clothes. That, um, just for one year, I would save that money up, just for one year. And I'd just live like a pauper, cheese sandwiches, two-minute noodles, whatever, ride my bike to work, save on petrol, do whatever I can do, just for one year. And one year's not that long. Think about it. What we, you know, how long ago was this time last year? It's not that long at all. But if that one year gets you into the property market, once you've got that first property, you don't need to do that again because that property will go up in value and you'll be able to buy more property off the back of it. So let's say we finally get to that first property, 400 grand. Let's buy it for that and 90% loan. Then we, all we need to do now is wait for that property to keep going up in value. Now, if we've done our research, that should happen within the first few, about two to three years, if we do our research well. If we do our research really well, and I've certainly achieved these results before, you can get well in excess of 100 grand in a year if you really know what you're doing. Now, um, those opportunities come along every, every probably three to five years where there are markets moving that fast. Um, there's certainly not every year that you can get 100 grand off a single property. But all you have to do is wait for the property to go up in value. Now it's up at 500 in this example. 90% is no longer 360, 90% is now 450, and the loan hasn't changed, it's interest only. But now we've got that space in between that we call available equity, as we talked about before. We then raise the equity loan, we go back to the first bank and say, hey, can we please have an equity loan? And now we've got up to 90 grand, 
and we can use that to pay the depositing costs on our next property, and then we'll get a 90% loan, and we'll build our portfolio like that. The key thing to understand about growing a property portfolio is that it's exponential in growth. So the first property might take about three years to give birth to the next one, but then as time goes by, it'll continue to go up in value, but now the second property will give birth as well. So we've got, now one becomes two, two become four, four become eight, eight becomes 16, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, one of my mentors, he, he taught me, he was at age 30, he had five properties, but he lost them all in a divorce and he started from scratch. By age 57, he had 76 properties. Now, and, and that's how we did it. He built it that way. But one of the things he said to me, he said, Damien, you must understand that two thirds of those properties were put on in the last one third of the time. So if it's taken him 30 years to get that number of properties, what he's saying is that, you know, 50 of those properties were put on in the last 10 years of that 30 years because it's exponential growth. It starts small and gets bigger. But the more properties you got, the more chance you've got of finding some equity somewhere. So the time interval between buying properties gets shorter as your portfolio grows. Okay, how to get started. First of all, you've got to save that deposit or borrow the money from family. Now, one of the things you might do, just going back a slide, um, one of the things you might do is when you get that first equity growth, you might use that to pay back the family member who lent you the money. And, uh, and so that, that instead of buying your next investment property and then wait for it to continue up and then get your next investment property. Use existing equity, uh, use your super. Now, um, if you're going to use your superannuation, you do need to get specific advice from a licensed financial planner. Um, but there is an opportunity now with self-managed super and I'll just talk about it in broad terms. Self-managed super funds uh, can be set up you can have up to four beneficiaries of a self-managed super fund, which is quite interesting. So a husband and wife couple could put their super funds together and then you can buy property within that super. Now, uh, the restrictions are that the property, you can't borrow any more than 80% inside super, so you do need a 20% deposit. So if you're buying a $400,000 investment property minimum price, that means, you know, 80 grand to be stumped up plus about 20 grand cost. Plus, you'd want to have a little bit of cash left over. So, if you've got over 100 grand in your super um, between you and your partner or you on your own, then you should definitely um, have a chat to us because we can point you in the right direction um, about making that, turning that into an investment property. Now, if you know much about investing, you'll, you would have heard of the 710 rule. Now, the 710 rule says that if I borrow, sorry, if I put 100 grand into something, and I get 7% for 10 years, it'll double. So if I put any amount of money into something and get 7% every year for 10 years, that amount will double. It's actually 196 of you is 100 grand. But can, so if your money's just into straight shares and there's no borrowed money to help you grow the portfolio in your super fund, then that's what you can expect. In about 10 years, it should double in value plus your contributions in between. But um, if you buy an investment property with that money, let's say you bought a $400,000 investment property and you put 80 grand down as the 20% deposit and then 20 grand as for the cost, well, then you would own at the start of that 10 year process, you would own a property uh, worth 400 grand with a $320,000 mortgage. Now, historically in the 1970s, house prices um, increased from three to four times from 1970 to 1980 in the, in the capital, in the eastern seaboard capital cities. In the 80s, they tripled. In the 90s, they less than doubled from 1990 to 2000. And of course, we had the big recession back then. Um, but they, they were pretty close, about 80 or 90% increase. And then last decade, they more than doubled in most capital cities. And, and this decade, we are tracking pretty strongly towards a double again. So if you bought an investment property instead with your super, and then it doubled in value in, in, in a period of time, call it 10 years or whatever you think it will, um, then you're going to have an $800,000 property with a 320 mortgage at the end, and then you've got 480 grand profit, as opposed to just having a cash investment of 100 grand in shares and then doubling it. So just something to think about, and um, we can talk more about that at another time. All right. Another option you may have is to pool your money with somebody else, and this can be a good idea when you're getting started, but you do need to be very careful about who you invest with and make sure it's somebody you trust. 
And you should also have from day one, the exit plan identified. So you should have a price point that you, that you agree you're gonna sell or one person's gonna buy the other party out. Because going forward after that first property, that joint venture can go from what was once an advantage can then become a disadvantage. Okay, what's the process for buying a property? Uh, well, first of all, if you come to, to get help from us, the first thing we'll do is take you through a coaching and planning session where we'll make a plan for you. And that's really important that you sit down with somebody with more experience than you and actually look at your options. Because often a trained eye will see opportunities that you've got no idea you've got. And, and if, if they'll point them out to you and that can make a massive difference um, to your success. Okay, then you need to talk about the location selection and then the property selection in that order. Okay, the location comes first and then you find the property you need. Uh, after that, you'll then do the paperwork on that property and make sure that you always have a finance exit clause just in case you can't get the finance. Get legal advice. Um, you need a good property lawyer. Now, one of the mistakes I see people make constantly is they go to, first of all, with the mortgage broker, they go to their mate's uncle's cousin who walks dogs for a bloke who washes cars for a friend of theirs who's a mortgage broker, and then they end up, they go with that person because there's some sort of connection. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're a good mortgage broker. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're a good solicitor. And it's really important that when, you, when you're putting your team of people together to help you, make sure that they are property investors themselves and that they understand all the little um, tricks of the, of the game. You know, being a solicitor is quite a broad profession and there's lots of different specialities. You need to have one that specialises in property. Also with finance, most nine out of 10 mortgage brokers are not good enough for you if you want to be a property investor. They deal primarily with homeowners who just want to buy their house. But if you want to build an empire, you need a really good mortgage broker who knows how to structure your finances correctly so you can keep growing. Um, once you've got all that, you can then submit your finance and get your approval. And then send in, as in, in the, before they hand the property over, you line up your building inspector and your rental manager. Settlement occurs. Get your county surveyor in for your depreciation schedule. And then hold your property as long as you can and to let the rents and values rise. Repeat the process and continue to grow your portfolio. You must make sure you've got a team of experts and you must make sure that you look after them. Now, most people, when, you, when you're born into a poor family type environment, you learn to try and save a dollar everywhere you can. And that can be a bit of a false economy when it comes to investing. When you're investing, you need a team of people to help you. You need someone who's helping you research, someone who's helping you find the properties, someone who's coaching and mentoring you to make sure you, you, make, you don't make any mistakes. You need a good mortgage broker, you need a good solicitor. You need good building inspectors wherever you're going to invest, a good rental manager wherever you're going to invest, a quantity surveyor who's going to do depreciation schedules for you. All of those people are quite important. But if you want them to help you and to get the best result for you, you need to be nice to them, okay? You need to look after them. When you're poor and you're paying someone to do a job for you, your mindset often is, you know what, I'm paying you money, you do what you're damn well told. And that's fine, but guess what? They're not going to work hard for you. And I'll give you an example. I had one client who wanted to uh, introduce him to an excellent rental manager and he wanted to screw the rental manager down from their percentage of 7.5% of the rent fee to 65 I said, well, why would you want to do that? And, uh, and he said, well, no one pays full price down. And I said, okay, that's interesting. So we worked out what the saving would be. The saving was going to be $200 a year off the rental management. Now, that may sound like worthwhile, and some people might be saying, oh, well, they all that up. But actually, what he'd done in the process of doing that is made himself the most unpopular landlord in that rental management agency. So picture this. Let's say you're a rental manager now. And you, you know, a rental manager, you're charging 7.5%. But of that 7.5%, probably the first 5% goes to paying all of your bills, and then there's only 2.5% left over for you to make any money. And then this bloke comes in and says, I want to take a percent off you. So he wants to take two-fifths of your profit off you. And that's quite a lot of money to you. Um, and he thinks he's just making a dollar. Now, on the other hand, let's say you've got four properties vacant at the moment. One of those properties belongs to him. But yet one of the other properties belongs to me. 
And every year at Christmas time, I send you some flowers or a bottle. Of, if you're a bloke, I send you a bottle of, of spirits and a card in the mail. And I say, hey, thank you very much for looking after my property. I sleep very well at night knowing that it's in such capable hands. You are awesome. I hope you and your family have a wonderful Christmas and uh, I look forward to seeing you in the new year. And throughout the year, whenever you, you know, you're talking to me on the phone or, or you're sending me SMS messages asking me for permission to do different things and decisions, I'm replying, hey, you're awesome. You're a rock star. Thanks very much. And I pay you full price. Now, my property's vacant. His property's vacant. In walks a great tenant into the rental management's office manager's office and they say hi I'm a highly paid such and such I've just moved to town and I need somewhere to live and you know who's getting that tenant not that guy I'm getting that tenant because I look after my rental managers and my rental managers in turn look after me now think about this every week that that property's vacant was going to cost him 450 bucks in lost rent revenue every week and he wanted to just screw that manager down to get 200 bucks so there's the lesson learned. It's a, full, uh, it's a false economy, right? You need to make sure that you look after the people who are looking after you. If when that hot opportunity comes along, it might be that great hot spot to invest. It might be that you know great discount interest rate that's only available for limited time. Or it might be all those different things. It might be the solicitor who's, who's running late to get home but stays home that extra hour to, do the, to make sure they do your job properly so you don't get stunned. You want those people going the extra mile for you. You don't want them cutting corners. Mortgage broker. Mortgage brokers are great when you're investing. You don't want to go to the same bank. Do not stay with the same bank. As a general rule, one property per bank, and that's it. Why? Well, if you stay with the same bank, Yes, they will look after you, but when you get to about four properties, they're going to stop lending you money. And the reason they're going to stop lending you money is because they're going to be too exposed to you. They're not going to be able to insure against you and all these things. We haven't got time to go into detail today, but, but follow that rule. You want to go, you want to have one property per bank. Now, to do that, you need a really good mortgage broker who knows what all those different lenders are. And 95% of mortgage brokers, and I'm not exaggerating, I mean that hard and fast, 95% don't know how to look after investors because they probably don't have investment properties themselves and they don't understand how to structure things correctly. Um, Rochelle, who works with all of our clients, you know, she won't employ a mortgage broker unless they've got seven years experience themselves in the first place. And that's the most junior broker in her office. So choose very carefully when it comes to your mortgage broker. And if you need a good mortgage breaker, get in touch with us and we'll be happy to connect you. Solicitor. Your solicitor works independently and must work for you and not be giving any kickbacks to anyone else. We have a couple of great solicitors that we recommend our clients to. Where there's no commercial relationship between us, but we just know they're very, very good and we know that they'll look after our clients. And you need them to oversee your paperwork. I do think that every investor should definitely read at least one contract in their life. Um, don't just blindly, um, don't just blindly hope that your solicitor is going to cover it off. You know, it's part of your learning journey to make sure you understand how it all works. Quantity surveyor uh, creates your depreciation schedule, critical to getting your tax benefits. Building inspector, as I spoke about earlier, you want a good building inspector who's going to go twice. Do the initial inspection and then a re-inspection to ensure everything's squared away. Rental manager. Now, as I said, look after your rental manager and they'll get you good tenants. Don't look after them, you'll get the bottom of the bucket. Okay? Um, you need a good rental manager to oversee all those things. Maintenance, repairs, regular inspections, report back to you. Good rental managers will provide you photos of any problems so you can see for yourself. They'll also handle disputes, chase over due rent, all those sorts of things. Do not manage your property yourself. Don't manage your property yourself. You might think, oh, okay, I can handle it, whatever. When that, per that person might be a friend or something like that, when that person, okay, uh, falls on hard times, they are then going to start hitting you up and they're going to expect that your friendship is going to give, let, cut them some slack. Now, you can't afford to do that. You need to preserve your own cash and you can't get people in a situation where they can support you. Get a rental manager. Don't talk to your tenants directly. That's your rental manager's job. 
they will be fair and impartial and they'll handle it in accordance with the law because that's what they have to do. If you allow yourself direct contact with your tenant, you're leaving yourself open to being manipulated, get the guilt trip put on you, and then the rent will be slow and before you know it, you won't have any money. And I've coached thousands of clients and I've seen it happen many a time. They put family members into their properties um, or they manage them themselves and then the rents never go up in accordance with the market. They, and they always, they cut them too much slack. They don't hold their feet to the fire on things because they're worried about their relationship with that friend or, or family member. Okay. Where to go from here if you want to get more help? Okay. Um, I used to be in the Army. I think I said that earlier. I was in for 14 years. And when I, um, when I was in the Army, I was actually looking for someone to help me. And I, uh, I made a lot of mistakes, actually, when I started in my property investing, mistakes that I could have easily avoided with the right help. So when I um, set up Integrity, the, the company, uh, I set it up in a manner that was designed to help the, um, the person that I was when I was working full-time, time for it, trying to get started. So, and, and one of my favourite quotes at the top there, fools learn from their own experience. I prefer to profit from the experience of others, and that's what you get with us. So if you are looking for some help, we can do a whole heap of things to help you. Yeah, you get me as your coach and strategist, I'll sit down with you and work out a plan and point you in the right direction, and you'll have a written plan on paper you can use. We've got the two Nicks, Nick and Nicholas, um, who help our clients in terms of uh, finding areas to invest and properties in those areas. We've got Ben, our research manager, uh, Ben's job is to uh, find those next hot spots at, under my direction, and so we and he's assisted by Charmy, our research analyst. We go to a lot of effort to find those areas, um, and we have some some uh, in-house uh, research processes where we pick up on the new where the jobs are being created, where there's land supply issues, all those sorts of things. Uh, we have Amanda, who's our client care manager. Her job is to look after clients who are in the process of acquiring properties and and, and their ongoing relationship with them. And then we have Rochelle, who's, uh, who's our mortgage broker. And then, of course, we have all of those uh, supporting things you need. If you need, uh, if you want to have a crack at self-managed super, um, or want to talk to someone about that, we have a great financial planner who is property friendly. Um, be very, very wary of dealing with financial planners and financial advisors because most of them won't talk to you about property. They'll, they're only licensed to talk to you about shares, super, um, managed funds, those sort of, and personal insurances. So they're not going to talk to you about property, and and in the process they're going to eliminate one of the number one, uh, I believe, and many people support this view with their research. The number one wealth creation strategy in this country is plain old rent residential real estate. Okay, this is a process we take our our clients through. Uh, it's a one stop shop. You get a one on one coaching session. Now those sessions can be done via Skype or if you're, uh, we travel all around the country. So um, if you can synchronize with our, whenever we're in that part of the world, or um, if you're in Brisbane, our head office is in Brisbane. But we do a one-on-one coaching. So that takes about two hours. We talk about your, your personal situation, how you've got to where you are now, what your goals are, what you want to achieve. And then we'll sit down and talk you through all the different options that you might have. And then you decide what you want done um, with our support. And we help you to make a plan that you're 100% comfortable with and makes sense to you. And then we'll go on about doing that. Now, if I'm in any doubt about your financial ability to invest, I'll uh, introduce you to Rochelle early in the process and get her to do a pre-approval type process. And then once you're ready to get an investment property, um, you'll get a location research briefing from us. So to help you, and that's the, the product of all of our research, to help you determine what location you want to invest in, then we'll help you get a property there and take you through the acquisition process, finance, uh, sourcing your finance, legal advice, building inspections, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then review and repeat. Um, if you don't want to go to that level next, uh, and obviously that's of enormous value, um, if you don't want to go to that value, that, that level next, that's okay. I completely understand. It's only a webinar and you only just got to know some of you. But um, what we do, it, you can look at the free training and I'll talk about that in a second. We do one-day courses all around Australia. So hang in there and just wait until I get to that slide and we can check that out. But the one-on-one -on -one appointment, that's what we do. Um, 
Review your situation, confirm your goals, review your options, make a plan to achieve those goals and provide you full support in achieving that plan. Now, normally, if you make an appointment with us any other time, um, it costs you $4.97. If you make the appointment on the back of um, a webinar or a training day, it costs you $2.97. And then you're fully supported by the team for life. Now, obviously, all the different services uh, that are provided by a solicitor and everybody else, they will charge you money for that. Our service, that's the only fee you pay. And we'll, we'll share with you our research and we'll source properties for you. We, much like a mortgage broker gets paid by the bank um, for introducing you to them, we do get a small referral fee from the people that we introduce you to when we source a property. Um, I've got two ways I can run a business like this. One is I can charge you $10,000 for the service. The other way is I can charge them money for introducing you to them. So it's the same model. Um, it's much better that way. Uh, some people might say, well, that's a conflict of interest. And I say, that's okay. Um, but if I put you into a property and it goes up in value 50 grand in a short space of time, then what are you going to think of me? And then what are you going to do after that? You know, you're going to recommend us to your friends. You're going to um, get, continue to be an investor and buy more properties and things like that and keep it. So we really bend over backwards to, to help our clients and make sure we're putting them in the right place. We have no loyalty to anyone but you. Um, and that's, that's my parting advice for you. Surround yourself with the right people, take control and take action, and you'll get some good results. All right, complimentary one-day training days. Now, we do do one-day training um, courses around Australia, and we do those uh, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, every capital city, uh, except for Hobart and some regional centres. Um, and this is what we talk about, how to think like a property investor, that should say, Historical market performance, so you can understand the history of property prices and future expectations. Talk about finance products, structures, how they all work uh, in detail. Then we talk about how to build a portfolio quickly, but also, very importantly, safely. We talk about location selection, property selection, and it's some really simple things you can do to manage all your risks along the way. This is the locations uh, that we're doing it. Uh, Brisbane, City, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth. Darwin, and then we've got Townsville, Toowoomba, Dolby, Mount Isa, Newcastle, Singleton, Canberra, Wagga Wagga, and Albury, Wodonga. Now, um, that brings us to the end of the webinar. If you want to jump straight to an appointment, just put in the, um, in, now, go to webinar will record everything you type in. So if you want to have an appointment, put appointment, please, plus your mobile number so we can call you, because I think all we'll have is your name and an email at the moment. But just put that in there. If you want to be registered for the training the next time we come to your location, please put training, please, the city and your mobile number so we can call you and get all those details in. And then if you have any general questions, just put them in the box as well.